Yeah, so I, I stopped doing, uh, is that, is this? I stopped doing obstetrics about uh, five years ago to focus more on midlife women's health, and that's kind of what I've been doing for a lot of years anyway. But um, so I'm kind of a recovering obstetrician, I guess. Is what I am. <laughs> so this morning, you know, I want to bring up more information for you about, you know, bladder health and overactive bladder, particularly because that is, you know, we talk a lot about stress incontinence and incontinence with exercise and leaking, but, but the overactive bladder has a bigger impact and, and is a harsher disease process. Uh, and as we've Im improved our ability to figure out and give advice and, and help people get around that corner, it's, it's fun to talk about it because 10 years ago this lecture wouldn't have made much sense because we didn't have very much. And now we've got things that we can help you with. So. We're going to run through that. Um, so that's the goal, right? We want to uh, go away, yes. So if we really look at quality of life and bladder function, um, it's, it's a big deal. Obviously, there's both sexual and physical and psychological and social and occupational uh, issues that, that go along with uh, the overactive bladder especially. And it has a huge impact in, in most women's lives. I've, as I've figured out how to do more of this stuff, I've realized I never knew it was as big of an impact as it is for a lot of people. So um, this, is, this is a fact that blows me away still. But uh, can you imagine there's, there's more, uh, uh, more money spent on uh, feminine products for incontinence than for menstruation? I mean, all the you know, period problems and usages, more money is, <clears throat> and more, more paper is spent on incontinence products. So a lot of misconceptions about this whole process. It's not a normal part of aging, although it does increase with time. As women age, it does increase, but it's not normal. It doesn't have to be. It's not supposed to be that way. And it's not failure. Um, a lot of people kind of hide from what did I do to deserve this? Uh, well, I mean, there are things that fit into it, lifestyle, diet, obesity issues. We'll talk about some of that. And surgery certainly isn't, for, especially for overactive bladder, surgery is not the therapy. It, it, it is not the therapy. So that's a huge misconception. And it's not mostly a minor problem, that's for sure. So we, we need to understand there's different types of incontinence. There's a stress incontinence, which is the exercise induced or activity induced and I like to um, kind of show people if, if this is your bladder and this is the urethra when people cough and strain what happens the bladder rotates and the urethra drops and then the urine comes out in spurts so it's an anatomic change which is entirely different from the overactive bladder which is a constricting of the bladder a contraction of the bladder that not doesn't have a lot to do with the anatomy so they're that's the two groupings, and the first thing you got to do is figure out what you have, and a lot of people have both. So if you have both, then we figure out which part is most bothersome to you and, and approach that first. So we'll talk about that a little more. We're not going to talk about this kind of <laughs> leakage. I, I don't know. How to, that's a behavioral problem, but not. To, <clears throat> so what happens is in, uh, in the types of incontinence, Stress incontinence and urge, which we just defined. Uh, stress incontinence actually goes down as women get older and urge incontinence goes up. And the mixed sum of both is, is pretty high. And these numbers are, are pretty significantly high. So uh, it is a, uh, a big deal, especially in, in older women and men too. You see it's more common in women than men, but men have a, a high rate also of both any incontinence or urinary and then We'll talk briefly at the end about bowel, bowel incontinence too, which is becoming a bigger issue and we're figuring out more things to do for that. That's just gonna be a little sidelight at the end we'll talk about. <clears throat> so, so yes, it goes up with age. So we need to find people. We need to have people come forward and say, yeah, I got this problem, well, how can you help me? So you really don't have to have a complicated questionnaire. Most people are checking in now with some sort of, um, check in paperwork or computer work uh, for data entry and you can simply say are you having problems with leakage or urgency and do you want help and if that if the answer is yes then most systems are able to put you in a in a data bank and call you back and say all right what do you want to do now you know so 
So we need to ask more and because there is more help to be done. Or you can have a more complicated questionnaire, which isn't necessary. You know, I, I, did, I should have mentioned earlier, I, I changed my slides around a little bit. I, did, you know, I, I didn't change anything until 20 minutes before I got here. But. So don't, don't really follow the handouts. Just write down stuff if you see something that's interesting, because it's, it's all in here, but it's in a different order, and it's got better pictures now. So. <laughs> And then you, you try to assess the bother, bother score. And it's interesting when you analyze uh, what problems people have and then try to figure out how much does it bother you. I mean, there's people with severe problems that say, I don't care, I mean, that's, I'm fine. And they're, so you really have to think about how much it bothers you. And a lot of data has been done on, on surveys and try to figure out um, how to get people to really think about what they have and, and give, give a number to it so they can decide whether they want help or not. So the only connection really between uh, the two kinds of incontinence, the stress and the urgency incontinence is when we do a physical examination, we're looking for anatomic changes and among those are, are the cystocele when the bladder drops from childbirth and tissue changes with aging. When the bladder falls down, that's called a cystocele or a seal means hernia. So it's kind of a hernia of the front wall of the vagina. And when the bladder drops, you can look, I don't know if you can see this very well. I mean, I'm talking to this one all the time, but so if, if the bladder has fallen down, sometimes urine will just sit in that area, and when it, it doesn't empty when you sit down and, and you go to the bathroom normally. So that irritates and irritates. Sometimes when you fix a cystocele, it corrects a lot of the overactive bladder sy symptoms just by stasis and irritation of that urine that doesn't, you, can, you kind of have to be able to pee up and over the corner, I guess, and that doesn't work so well. So that's the only connection with anatomy, really, between the, the two types of incontinence. So a bladder diary is crucial to help us figure out, and it's, it's amazing how often um, we do a two or three day minute, two or three day bladder diary. We send you home with a little plastic hat to put in the toilet and not wear on your head, or not let your kids wear on your head. You know. But um, then we can see how much you leak when you leak, how much you're going, and really assess what your bladder is doing. And a lot of women are just amazed at when they see, wow, if I, I drank coffee and then I had overactive bladder, and I, had, I drank a bunch of orange juice this morning, and then I had, you know, so you can do, you be your own detective. And we look at the bladder diary and figure out a lot of behavioral changes that are, are kind of going to first base to get, to get things fixed up. So it'll help you figure out, it'll identify bladder stimulants, we'll talk about in a minute. And it, it really helps document how much leakage there is. Some of the other procedures that, are, that we get to if we can't manage things with behavioral changes, uh, the insurance companies are saying, you, you gotta have evidence that these people really have this to go to the next stage, so a bladder diary helps with that. In the office, we can do bladder function testing, and we don't need to do it very often. Uh, in, in most women either have straightforward stress incontinence or they got you know, horrible overactive bladder. If they got mixed incontinence, some of each, or we can't figure things out, we look for funny variants. And so in the office, we can do, you know, ask a bunch of questions, put a little catheter in, and, and, and do some analysis of how the bladder works, when you feel, what you feel, and that. And, and we can come up with kind of like an EKG of your bladder here. We can, that doesn't make much sense to you, but it makes quite a bit of sense to me. So sometimes we find certain variants that oh no, we're going this way, or we'll do this way. So that is done on you know, maybe 10 or 20% of people with significant incontinence issues. Um, so when we look at a big long list of what, what things can we do, um, it's a big list, and we'll go through most of these, but it's basically like most things, it's behavioral, um, behavioral or it's medical or it's procedural. So we'll, we'll kind of analyze those and explain some of that as we go. Um, there are pessaries. Pessary is a plastic device that can be put in the vagina that, you know, kind of oftentimes is used to hold up prolapse, um, like a, a, you know, kind of a big rubber donut sort of that, if fit right, works for people. Um, it's not, it doesn't work real well for a lot of real active people, but but there are pessaries that have kind of a, a knob on them that sits up in front by the bladder and is um, at least touted as being a incontinence uh, product. I don't, I'm, 
I haven't had a lot of good results with pessaries for incontinence, pessaries for prolapse in a non-surgical patient, that's worthwhile. But for, for incontinence, it's, it's not very helpful. You can try it, but, but that's not so good. Um, so when we look at, at, at treatments, and we're going to move beyond this, but just for stress incontinence, we do various, we do things that stimulate the vagina or inserts of types, and, and we do surgical things. For urge, we do medications, and we'll talk a little about Botox and, and what we call neuromodulation in a, in a little bit. But, but medications and behavioral therapy or behavior modifications are the, are the cornerstone. There's products like, this is a new, well not new, in the last couple of years, this poise insert business is on the market to um, prevent incontinence. It's a spongy material, it's kind of like, it's sort of like tampon material, and it's shaped that way, and it's sold as a incontinence preventer, but what it really does pretty well is absorb urine like, a, like other absorbent products would. So it's, it's not very successful, but the company's doing great. All you gotta sell is one box to 10 million women in the country, and it doesn't work, and they made a lot of money. So I'm not sure that this is gonna be the answer. I haven't found it to be. So what I figured out a few years ago when I started saying I'm going to do this, I'm going to be a, you know, kind of a modified urogynecologist, I wanted to have, like I say, all the tools on, it, on my tool belt. So when you come in, if you've got urinary issues, we'll find something that works. We'll figure it out, we'll do our homework, and then we'll go ahead. And we can fix, we can make 80, 90 percent of people better. So it's, it's nice to be able to say that, and it's true. Overactive bladder is very common. Um, one out of six uh, in the U.S. have overactive bladder symptoms. Now this is a schematic that this is overactive bladder prevalence, this is asthma, this is diabetes, this is osteoporosis, Alzheimer's. So, you know, in terms of pure numbers, that's a big, that's a big, big number. So it makes sense to try to help and put a lot of research into fixing it. So what happens is, as the bladder fills, something creates irritation in the bladder, either from something that you ate or drank, or you know, tumors in the bladder can do that, or overstimulation of the nerves that go to the bladder can do that. So we'll, we'll define that a little bit more. But as the bladder fills, then it, it, it has the urge to contract. It's irritable, so it contracts. And women with urge, urge incontinence or overactive bladder, when they have a leakage episode, it's a lot because the whole bladder contracts rather than spurts like happen with, with stress incontinence. So that's the difference usually in history. So, so when, when we have, we've got frequency including nighttime urination, we'll define in a minute. Overactive bladder includes these pieces and the urgency component. I mean, some women have, you know, they, they have the urge to urinate and urinate 20 times a day, but they don't have leakage. They just go all the time and they get this tiny little shrunk up bladder that feels irritated all the time. So that's in the grouping of overactive bladder even without incontinence. Some people call that dry incontinence as opposed to wet incontinence. I don't like those terms, but anyway. And so then urgency incontinence is in the middle of that. That's the group that has the urge, I gotta go, I gotta go stuff. Um, and well, we'll go by that. So, and the, the prevalence of these symptoms goes up over time for both men and women. So age, we showed that earlier, but that's kind of an interesting graph. Get out in the 70s and it's, it's a lot more common. So the people that have this problem, we kind of call them toilet mappers. So they know where all the restrooms are and you know, there's some pretty funny uh, ways to get into restrooms and I don't know how involved we want to get into that, but you know, men here, you know, so, so they, I, I really, I mean, some people when they, they're going to go to Sam's Club, they know right where the bathroom is, and you know, I'm kind of that way too, but I don't know why, but anyway, um, <laughs> um, so the toilet mappers really know where, and sometimes, you know, when you get overactive and you're, you're in a pretty long line here, that's, that's a problem, so you know where that toilet is, but it doesn't help you much. So it's the, the run to the bathroom with urgency. And this, this lady's a little more of a problem, probably. So now, this is what I really like. Most people don't quite go to that extreme to have the, uh, the toilet seat on the trailer hitch, but you know, I mean, so when we're doing urodynamic tests, we ask, you know, 
when you we ask, when do you feel like you have to, as we're filling the bladder, when do you feel like you have to go? When would you get up from watching a good TV show? When would you get up from watching your best TV show and race to the bathroom? And when would you pull over by the side of the road and go? And I got some great stories, I'll tell you. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, that's a fun interview. But I haven't, I haven't really seen this, but they're out there, I suppose. Or then, now this is the uh, potty at the end of the rainbow. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll move on. So you've got to identify triggers. There are certain triggers that make people have the urge to go and identify those and move away from those. So it's, you know, moving, moving water. Um, it's key in the door is the craziest one or garage door going up and then, uh, so everybody has to figure out their own, doing dishes, uh, figure out your own triggers and then try to have mind games to be able to overcome those triggers. It's possible. You just have to figure out a way to distract yourself. Um, so lifestyle changes, food and diet modification, and bladder retraining. Those are the main behavioral techniques. So oftentimes we'll, you can't probably see this real well, but we, in medicine now we, we do all this algorithm stuff and we have a flow chart and we go down the flow chart because it feels real scientific and, and you know, we feel smarter if we use one of these things. But most of the time common sense is you, you evaluate something, you use conservative therapies, which is either bladder training or, or fluid management or sometimes pelvic floor muscle training or bladder control strategies. If that doesn't work, then you go on and you might do medicines. If that doesn't work, then you do some of the more advanced therapies. So that's, that's what we're gonna talk about now. Kegel exercises, everybody's heard of Kegel exercises. I'm not gonna have anybody, if I ask the group, raise your hand if you had success with Kegel exercises by yourself, I, you know, I'm not gonna get a lot of hands going up. But if you're trained right and you learn what to do and how to do it, pelvic floor exercise is helpful for both stress and overactive bladder. Uh, we didn't used to think it was very good for overactive bladder, but it can help a lot. So, so um, you know, kegels, you know, here's, here's a sheet of kegels, go home and do this, that doesn't work. Or whenever you go to a stop sign, you know, do five kegels, nobody can tell you're doing it, you know, whatever. <laughs> but that doesn't work very well either. You have to have a program and consistently do it. So, oh, I put, I put Sheree's picture way down in the corner here, darn it. I didn't, so anyway, we have, you'll, you'll meet Sheree coming up, but, but we, as, as part of uh, bladder health in our center, um, we decided a year or so ago to, to bring somebody like Sheree in who's got a lot of experience with pelvic floor work. And so uh, she sees a lot of people to help educate them on their pelvic floor, to, to strengthen their pelvic floor. We saw oftentimes we'll use it even after surgical therapy to to boost the long-term results. So um, that is, that's becoming a bigger and bigger part of the clinics that do this and do it well. So bladder retraining, what, you start with a bladder diary, you figure out a schedule, and you try to increase the intervals between, between voids. Because like I tell people, you, you either train your bladder or your bladder trains you. And um, it's really true. So if you go too often, you go just in case, you know, that might feel smart, but it, over the long term, that's not as good. So you actually want to lengthen out the space, the time, interval between voids, and that makes your bladder more functional. Uh, increases your bladder capacity. Um, it's, it's, you set a program, and that's where somebody like Sheree can, and can say, here's, here's your goals, here's how you do it, here's the program, check back with me. And it's usually just a couple visits till you're all tuned up in, in how you should be doing this, these things. So. Um, the stopping the urge, you get the urge, the key's in the door, you really got to go, what do you do? Well, you, you run and make it, or you run and don't make it, or you might figure out how to play mind games and talk yourself out of it. Either deep breathe or count backwards, if you can, I don't know, and um, concentrate on a difficult task or something. Um, contract your, do quick contractions of your pelvic floor muscles or I don't know, pull nose hairs or do something kind of cool that distracts you from your bladder. So uh, that is very helpful to do. And it's kind of an interesting uh, introspective adventure and it, it, it does help. 
So other things, you know, yoga fits into that grouping um, of, you know, mind, body build up and build pelvic floor muscles. A lot of people kind of are starting to recommend do a few yoga poses before going to bed to get your pelvic floor right, get your mind right, and then you, you go to bed better. Um, but this is a big one. I mean, and this, this goes and in, in, um, inter, interacts a little bit with what you heard earlier about, about dietary thing. There are clearly foods to avoid with an overactive bladder. And in the bladder diary, if you dove deep enough, you'll find that. So most common, it's uh, caffeinated drinks and alcohol. Carbonated drinks somewhat, citrus fruits, fruits and juices. Um, I probably put the wrong fruits in here because half of you have a fruit bowl this morning with all these great <laughs> fruits in it, and those aren't necessarily citrus, so I, I don't want to tell you not to eat the food we brought here for you this morning. And, and uh, the, um, the artificial sweeteners are kind of an issue too, so you think, well, you know, I'm, I'm not drinking real pop, I'm just using artificial sweeteners, that's an issue and whatever big grouping of, of uh, caffeinated drinks. So, and, and then whatever alcohol, all alcohols are, you know, diuretics and irritants. So, um, you know, these are the things that you want to figure out and spicy foods too, hot sauce, jalapenos and that stuff. So that's, that's quite a list of things that might bother your bladder. You do your detective work and you figure out what it is and you back off on those things if you can. And smoking is a real bladder, bladder irritant. So, you know, urologists in the old days used to say, I can look in your bladder and tell if you're a smoker. That's like, ooh, really? I mean, I'm not a smoker, but I mean, that's, uh, that's enough, it has enough effect in your system that it even affects the bladder and, and causes irritation. So, nocturia is a sleep, is basically sleep disturbing urination. Now, I guess, you know, by people getting in their 40s and 50s and 60s, you get up at night once, most people do, or if you sleep all night, that's fine. By definition, this is two or more, and if it's four or more, it's severe. And a lot of the people we're aggressively treating with overactive bladder, you know, if you can't sleep at night, you're not healthy. You know, you lose your pump and you really lose, lose a lot of your happiness by being sleep deprived, and the bladder can do that. So. It's actually the largest concern for a lot of women with overactive bladder. Quality of sleep, quality of life. So what can you do for that? Well, you restrict, restrict liquids in the evening. That makes sense. If you, if you don't drink liquids after six o'clock, you're probably not gonna have as much urine made to go and have to get up for. But women with overactive bladder seem to make more urine at night, just almost by definition. So you lay down, your heart works different, you've got swelling in your legs that gets mobilized and goes, turns into pee in the night and, and there you go. So, you know, sometimes just doing things like elevating your legs late in the evening for an hour to get that, get that fluid out of your legs so when you go to bed it's gone already. It's just simple things like that that might help. Um, Early evening exercise is kind of interesting, just a little bit to sort of dehydrate or change your, your, your body flow. So, and take medicines like diuretics, take them in the morning. You take a diuretic late in the day and you know, you're gonna be up at night because your body is forced to do that. You can't do anything about that. So I'm at the age when an all-nighter just means that I don't have to get up for a pee, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Anti-acid is kind of cool. So, okay, now we're, I'm gonna move on from the, from the behavioral change things and kind of talk about medicines and a couple of the other procedural things and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So there's two groups of medicines. The, the group that's in this column here are all similar. They're what we call anti-muscarinics that affect bladder function by uh, a kind of a complicated anticholinergic effect, you know. And this Merbitric is the newest one, and that's in a whole different grouping, and that works through a different way with a little less uh, uh, side effects. So there's a lot of drugs. Whenever there's a list this long, that means none of them won. You know, it's kind of the way it is. I mean, seriously. So none of those, we can try, if one doesn't work, two might, but after two, you're not gonna find a better one. So uh, that, it works. All, through all these different organ systems, that's why there's so many side effects with, with that group of drugs. So there's a lot of them, there's a high side effect profile, 
long-term therapy with these drugs, unfortunately, is kind of uncommon. So if you, if you look at, at, this was a study from a few years ago, uh, over the years, first refill, second, third, fourth refill, uh, by a year, only 15% of people are still taking these drugs. Now, the ones that it works for, they're great. They're, they're automatic pilot uh, with side effects, or if you go to the generic oxybutyn and everybody has dry mouth and constipation and quits. So that's what your health plan will say you're supposed to take. That's, you know, three bucks a month. The stuff that works is uh, 70 bucks a month. And it's not my fault. I can't do anything about that. I can give you coupons and you can go fight with your, your, your pharmacist and sometimes it works, but it's just too bad. So these drugs are all a little more expensive than you'd want it to be and over, over time don't work as well. Here's a, a study of several different drugs and they all had the same by a year, uh, you know, decreased effectiveness. Side effects, especially in older people. The, the blood-brain barrier is something that if the drugs go across the blood-brain barrier, then you can get sleep, you know, get tiredness and sleepy and mental fog and things, so it's, it's a big deal. Uh, so the transdermal system, this is an over-the-counter one that some people like more. It, it, it works it, it probably as well as the other ones, and it's, it's less expensive, but it's not you know, through your, your, uh, your insurance program. Vesicare is my favorite one in that group because it, it has a better effect. I'm not, you know, I mean, I, I'm probably not supposed to be using brand names. I don't care. I mean, it, it's, this is, there are some that work better than others, and this is what I prefer. But most of the time now I'm prescribing the one in the other column that, that goes through your beta receptors rather than through the anticholinergic, and you don't need to know about that. But this one is, has kind of swept the market now. So um, if... If you've tried one of the other groups and had and no success and haven't tried this yet, then, then we want to try this before we try anything else. Vaginal estrogens are important, and that's been a big deal. So um, vaginal estrogens will help. This was a head-to-head -head with oxybutynin, and then they did just as well. So vaginal estrogens are important as therapy for the urethra mucosa and the bladder mucosa respond to estrogen similarly. So that's something that should be done. So, you know, Botox now is being used for everything, you know. And I tease the rep, I see it, it's 100 units, I see, you know, I'm gonna put in 95 units in the bladder and then I'll save five and let's put in the crow feet. He goes, yeah. you don't, I go, no, I don't do that. But I mean, <laughs> we talk about it, but it, so um, it's, 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 it's very effective. It was approved five years ago and what happens is, and like all Botox, it wears off. So it's every five, six, seven year, uh, months, you have to have a, a re-up. But it's done simply with, a, with a, a, a cystoscopy in the office, numb the urethra, fill the bladder with water with, with, with Novocaine in it, and then use a long needle, and we're watching this, and we just put a little bit in like 20 different spots here. It doesn't really, it doesn't hurt. People don't have pain with it. So it's kind of a nuisance thing to have to do every few months, but it works. And uh, so that's Botox in the bladder. I can show you some numbers here. But. And then the last grouping is this neuromodulation thing where that's the, the, the nerves that go to the bladder at the bottom of the spine, all the nerves come off kind of like tentacles, you know, like an octopus. There's all these nerves go to different things. And the one that goes to the bladder is the sacral third nerve. We know right where it goes. And that's the nerve that's overactive. Now, it's kind of crazy. You've, you've heard of a TENS unit, most of you, right, for pain? So that's a product that stimulates the nerve with continuous, inter, continuous intermittent stimulation. Sounds oxymoronic, but it, you know, that's... So that turns off the overactive nerve if you stimulate it continuously with this little pulses. So what we can do is um, get to the point where we can get right next to that nerve and stimulate it. So you... I want to go here. I want to show you this first. So you, um, you, you go down with the Novocaine in the back. It's below the spine, so there's no injury. There's really not much there. And you go through these little holes in the, in the sacrum, and you can put a little electrode right next to the nerve that goes to the bladder, and we can do some testing to make sure that happens. But um, this is just done in the office. It's a test. If it works, then go to the next step and um, put a, a tined lead in that doesn't move anywhere, and then... Here's this little pacemaker. We can make a little spot in your butt and put that underneath there, run the, in, your, in your buttocks, excuse me. 
And um, so you run the wire underneath the skin and go to that area, and that is the brains. It's all, you set it, and it works for, it, you know, it's five-year battery, and, and you're off and rolling. So there's a little rigmarole of this, but it really, it really works well. Um, so you can see the end here, it's got, that's right down next to the nerve. It's curved, and there's all kinds of technicalities to put this in. It's kind of interesting. But if you look at life improvements, it really works very nicely, 80, 90 percent, and in my experience, it's been pretty positive. So these are the numbers for success. So that, that, this is kind of the, you know, people say that's the last thing I want to do because it's more involved than anything else, but in certain cases, it maybe shouldn't be the last thing you do because it works so well in, in short term. So it's like, do you want, are you willing to do Botox every six months or do you want a five-year fix? And everybody has a different answer to that. And it doesn't matter, they both work. So the other thing I was gonna show you was this other way of neuromodulation. It sounds crazy, but you can, you can put a little acupuncture needle back here in a nerve, the posterior tibial nerve, and stimulate it. And that nerve travels to the brain kind of with the nerves that go from the bladder. So that's a way of doing peripheral stimulation. Now this is a 30 minutes a week, you come to the office for three months, and every week you have this put in. You know, you read the women's journals and, and it doesn't hurt and you sit around and talk to, talk to maybe your friends, I don't know. But um, this thing is getting uh, more popular, but then there's more maintenance to that. You do it for three months and then every month you do it again. And so, you know, depending on the situation, this works, this is also a form of neuromodulation. So I'll finish here. Um, So the, we just talked about pelvic organ prolapse and urinary problems together. That's pretty common. So these are all the management things we can do. Uh, I didn't talk much about some of the things that are less likely. Just want to give you just a quick heads up on this mesh thing. You know, we, the slings and the mesh for stress incontinence. Um, it all came about from this FDA warning years, years ago about pelvic organ prolapse surgeries. Great big sheets of mesh put in. They weren't focusing at all, the FDA, on the slings and the things we do for stress incontinence. It was all about big sheets of mesh. Same mesh, but it's not about the mesh, it's about the procedures. So most of those procedures went away. So I just want people to know this is not, it's not, uh, these lawyers are, are doing what they do and they're making a lot of money kind of advertising on TV and scaring people. And you see the same ad 50 times and you finally believe it. So it's a bunch of ambulance chasers trying to get to court and this, is the way I feel about it. It's just, it's just sad. Smoke coming out of our ears because it's really been misadventured. There's a little data on laser rejuvenation. You've been hearing maybe about that. Maybe there's some attitude. There's some evidence that, that doing that will strengthen the vagina. Um, it's early. We're not doing it yet for vaginal health, for urinary incontinence health. But it, it's there's some possibility. And I just mentioned. Also the fecal incontinence thing. Now this, this inner stim that I talked about, the nerve and the, the electrode that goes to the nerve, it, that goes to the, the same nerve goes to the rectum. So the people that have bladder or bowel accidents and fecal incontinence, they're even less likely to talk about it because of the embarrassment factor and whatever. But this inner stim helps both of those. So 30 or 40% of people have both. It works like 90% of the time for bowel, bowel health. So there are some things that are out there that, that are valuable. And this is, this is new news, but it, it's, it's real news. So I'm starting to um, use this for uh, fecal health also. So we talked about a bunch of things today, and I hope, hope you got a, a pretty good look at it. So I, I would ask you, really? You know, do we, do we really have to do that? So I'd say we now have therapies, so too few women know about it. We still look at it as kind of the whisper disease. It, it shouldn't be, so uh, spread the news. You know, we got, we got our center in Plymouth that we do a lot of work with, and I just love this guy. I should have been doing this the whole time. It's a no-brainer. Look at that kid. Isn't he great? Anyway, um, so there, there are things that we can do. Our, our website is, has, has information, education, and answers, and... And, and I hope we can uh, help the people in our community that need this kind of help, so. <laughs>